All right. What do we see as an accident right now? We have one victim right now? We have one victim in the blue car. If we look through the front windscreen, we can see him. His, his head is not in a neutral position, which is a concern for the medic because he's non-responsive. So the priority is to get in and make sure the casualties airway is what we call patent, so it's okay. open. And they can, uh, they can breathe in, they can breathe out, they can take oxygen in and oxygenate the, uh, the brain. What the medic will do to assist that, he should put the head in the neutral alignment and then he should administer uh, oxygen, O2. And that helps uh, with the breathing and the respiration. Okay. Medical's gone inside now. The medic's managed to squeeze through the hole, the small hole we, uh, we created for him. So what the guys are doing now, normally before you get in the vehicle, you would stabilize the vehicle to protect the patient from any movement. But of course, if the patient is actually not breathing and not responsive, then the movement of the, of the patient is really become secondary. And our primary focus is to open the airway. So you may have seen what the guys did while the medic got in, is they actually held the vehicle and they did what we call manual stabilization. Okay. Once the patient's airway is opened, what they will then do is revisit stability and do it uh, more solidly. Okay. So there is an element of risk in what they did, but remember the, the benefit of opening the patient's airway, that's why they are on scene, is to, more to save than life. Stabilizing. Yeah. Yeah. So they did it in a safe way, but they did it rapidly. Now they're going back and they're doing a more comprehensive stability job. So they're now using ratchet straps, which is Essentially what they're doing is the, the two cars are obviously touching, but they're going to use a ratchet strap to actually fasten the cars together to make the two cars essentially one footprint and make it more stable. Okay. So not only does it make the cars stable, but it makes the whole scene a lot safer. This is probably a really stupid question of my side, but can you not only, like with these six guys, tip the red car over? No, you're right. You're right. It was a stupid question. <laughs> 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 Sorry, that's my sense of humour. Um, there is a school of thought that says, yeah, why, why would you not do that? But what you're doing is you're introducing a massive element of risk for the rescuers. It might be hard to, to kind of take this, but the most important people we see here, if this was a real scene, unfortunately, is it's, it's actually not the patients inside. The most important people are the rescuers themselves. Okay. If they become injured, the whole focus of the work will shift to that individual rescuer because they're a team or a family. True, all right. Um, now, and again, that sounds a little bit harsh because everyone's there for the patient, but in terms of, of importance, they have to look after their own welfare. By risky moving that car, they massively increasing the risk on scene. And yeah, they will benefit from it, but these guys are highly skilled enough to be able to put, actually fasten the cars together and still work an effective plan to extricate. So it's all about having options, but do it in the safest possible way. But actually the relocation of a vehicle to make your access a lot easier is, is a viable option. It's just that in this case, you would, you would elect to do it with maybe, a, well, maybe not a forklift, but you would try to do it by some mechanical means rather than everyone just using their muscles, you know, because okay. it, it's, at the end of the day, it's not so safe. But it was it, a stupid question. It, no, it wasn't a stupid question. <laughs> What's happening now, you can see, and a good team will always do this. What they're doing is they'll spend no more than 20 or 30 seconds coming up with an extrication plan. And they're making sure everyone is aware of that plan. The only person who's not aware of it is the medic or two medics in the car. Inside. These guys have agreed a plan now, and that will be communicated to the medic. But not only communicated, the incident commander will say, this is our plan. Does that work with the patient's injuries? So the whole plan is, is communicated and agreed upon, and everyone now is working in the same direction. What this guy's doing here is lifting the bonnet to see if the battery's connected. So he's identified, I think, that the battery's disconnected, and he's got to go straight back to the incident commander, and he's told the incident commander that the battery's disconnected. That is, that is excellent. You know, that's yeah, an excellent that. way of working. Perfect. Because you can identify hazards or identify things, but if you don't communicate them, it puts a whole team at risk. So everything yeah. is about communication. What the guys are doing, they put a sheet through the vehicle because they're going to remove the glass. So they've essentially created a curtain and they've divided the car. So they're going to break the glass behind the curtain and that offers just another level of protection to the patients inside. 
So the oxygen charge is just a dust mass on. When you break glass, it creates um, what's called amorphous silica, which is fine glass dust, and it's it's a nuisance. It's a respiratory hazard. So the guys just stick on a dust mask while they're managing glass. When the glass management is over, they'll take the dust mask down and they'll just carry on with the rescue. Obviously, dust mask protects the respiratory system, but it also it, it inhibits communication as well. Yeah, of course. So to, for every advantage, there's a disadvantage, and that's what the guys have to work around, you know? It's also good, you know, we have quite a big crowd here and the firefighters who are watching will pick up tips and tricks. Um, they will also be standing, standing there saying, well, I would do it a slightly different way, but that's what <laughs> firefighters are like. They have uh, very strong professional pride and that's right because they're all professionals. So everyone will be casting their own views uh, on how they would do it. But also they will, they will, even the people who are watching will go away with, with, uh, with some tips and tricks from this, uh, this challenge. And since you've created different scenarios, no one can actually use like what they've previously seen for their challenge? Theoretically, we could actually use the same scenarios for every team. All we have to do is change the location of the patient and change the, the pattern of their injuries because then even though the cars are in exactly the same place, the whole method of extrication will change. Yeah. So, yeah, we could do that. But also, we like to offer a little bit of variety. And we know that some of these teams are really experienced. And, yeah, although this is a challenge, a good team, as soon as they walk into the pits, all six members of a very good team will automatically know about 90% what the plan will be. And that's because they've worked together for so long, they plan for things like this, back at their fire departments, they will set up things like this, they will go through stability and glass management, and they will try and really test themselves. Um, and that's why these guys can perform so well. They're just recalling the knowledge and experience and muscle memory of things they've done for years and years. So the guys are now working with spreaders to try and open the, uh, the boot of the car, the trunk of the car. Um, and that's going to be their prime method of getting in and getting out. Similar to the last challenge where the car was on its roof, it's very difficult having access or having no access from both sides. So they're going to have to go in through the back and probably out through the back as well. Is there any possibility of getting the victim out of the front window? Well, like I said before, you can get a patient through quite a small hole. But what you do when you when you take them through a small hole is you compromise the injuries. So okay. if they have uh, a spinal injury or an injury of the pelvis or the legs, the more you rotate them and turn them and take them away from a, a neutral, what we call a neutral straight alignment, the more you're going to compound those injuries. So your pelvis, which is the, the big bone at the top of your legs, if, if, if your pelvis breaks, which is, is quite a common injury in road traffic collisions, then your body contains five litres of blood and all your blood volume from your body can be lost in that broken bone. Okay. So, you know, uh, a fractured pelvis, if it's unstable, can be, uh, it is a life-threatening injury, there's no doubt about it. So if we elect to take our patient through the window and we twist and we turn them, we're going to make that worse. Yep. And don't forget, um, the firefighters will normally arrive on scene after about 10 minutes. The extrication will take 20 minutes. So now we're 30 minutes into this patient's injury. Yes. Just like when you cut yourself shaving, after 20 or 30 minutes, the blood starts to clot and congeal. An internal injury is exactly the same. The, the blood will start to clot inside the body. Okay. So when these guys come to take out the patients after what is effectively 30 minutes, they have to treat the patient very, very carefully because an internal bleed is like an external bleed and that clot will be popped if we, if we kind of, if we really aggressively handle them. So even when all the space has been created, they still treat the patient very, very gently to protect their injuries. Medic is coming out. Yeah, I think he's probably the second medic. There's probably one still in there. And now they're, they're having a little group hug around the back. He's updating the incident commander on the patient's injuries. And what, what the incident commander will do there is he will have his plan in mind and he will have an update from the medic and he will decide, yes, this plan is still viable, we can still go with this plan. Or maybe because of what we know now about the patient, maybe we have to change one or two things. So it's all about getting constant information, processing the information and acting accordingly on that information.
So you can see when we've set up the scenario, all the airbags in the vehicles, we've, we've actually set them off. I feel it's more realistic if you set off the airbags because obviously in a, in a crash, the airbags are going to detonate. And also, yeah, also with the airbags deployed, when the, when the team first come into the pits, it's very difficult to identify where your casualty yes. is because you can't see past the airbags. Yeah. So it just I adds could. a little bit of an extra dimension, a little bit of reality as well. So. And I'm sure the teams appreciate it at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so what the guys are doing, this is very good. They're actually peeling and exposing the plastic trim on the vehicle before they cut it. Because there are certain things on the vehicle they want to avoid cutting. There's, there's some very strong bolts and nuts that hold the seatbelts in place. But also, more critically, there's some very high pressure cylinders that okay. are attached to the airbags. Now, it's not so crucial here because the airbags have actually detonated, so there's no pressure stored within those. But what the guys are doing is they're removing the plastic just to make sure it's safe to cut. And when they're happy, they actually mark and scratch the outside of the vehicle because that gives them a reference point All right. when they come back with the cutters. So All right, it looks like what the guys are actually going to do is they're going to cut. If you look at a car from the front, the windscreen and side windows are attached to the A post. The middle post between the two doors is the B post, and then you have the C post at the back. What they're probably going to do is cut the C post at the back and then make what we would call the relief cut in the roof, and they're going to flap half of the roof forward, and that'll give them casualty access. I have to say, the guys are working really well. They're making good progress. Um, it, it, when you look at it, not a lot has changed, but they've actually made a lot of progress. The medic inside will be doing a full top-to-toe survey, talking to the patient, getting all the relative information. Do they have any medical problems? Are they taking any um, medicines, things like that? So I think what the guys are trying to do, Felix, is trying to remove the rear seats, just to gain a little bit more access. I think maybe the plan has changed. Maybe they're not going to take flap the roof. I think they're going to try and tunnel in, recline the seat, and take the patients out. And I think that will be dictated by the incident commander actually looking at his watch. So he's noticed the time. He's slightly adapted his plan, and they've slightly changed direction, I think. This guy here, you see, periodically they're going to recheck stability. So everything, yeah, they stabilise it, but everything's dynamic. So as you start to remove weight from the vehicles or you add weight by a patient, uh, patient carer getting in, you need to recheck your stability. So what they're doing now, Felix, is they're looking at an, a way of relocating the seat. So I think what they're going to do is recline the back of the seat, and then they're going to put the board in and take the patient out. What they've done is, like I said before, it's what we call tunneling, going in and coming out the same way. 
It's a difficult technique because you're working in a confined space. They haven't created a great deal of space. However, if they keep the patient in neutral alignment, you know, it, it, is, it is a very effective extrication. But they have made their life more difficult by going in and out the same way. But sometimes, with time constraints, you don't have much of an option. And also, when you have people setting things up like me and my colleagues, sometimes it can be very difficult. <laughs> What would have been the perfect uh, outcome if you, like, when you designed the scene? It's 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 a again it's a good question. The perfect outcome is for the patient to be released in 20 minutes in a casualty-centered manner. How they do that, there is no right and wrong. So there's there is, is no there a way you thought about when there you is no, it. Yeah, I mean, with something like this, I would be looking to take the roof off. Um, that will that that will be minimally invasive for the patient, although it will take a little bit more time. So everything is, is a balance between time and what they can realistically okay. achieve in that time. Um, but they've, they've removed the back seat, they've created some space. Now, providing they know the casualty's injuries and they know they can now recline the seat, put the board in and get the patient out, providing the medic assessor says, yeah, that's in line with the patient's injuries, then that's an excellent extrication. Um, it's very easy to sit here and say, I would do this, I would do that, but I'm not There's in there. no right I, and wrong. There is no right and wrong. The only time something becomes wrong is if it's inherently dangerous to the crew or it's not casualty-centred. And that's when, as, a, as an observer or as an instructor, as a trainer, you can say, guys, it was one option, but I think a better option would have been this. Yeah. So the assessors, when they debrief, they won't say, guys, I think you should have done this. They assess exactly what they see. And the only time an assessor will, will offer an alternative is after 20 minutes, they're nowhere near getting the patient out. And what a good assessor will then do is say, you know, you didn't make enough progress. Would you have considered this? Yeah. Okay. And that's the only time an assessor will say, you know, maybe you should have considered something else. So now, you see, because of the tunnelling, they have to go get access to the patient through the window. Now, Dara, and I hope he's not listening, or his family are not listening on live stream. Dara, um, I don't think he eats too much salad. <laughs> so he's, uh, you know, he's, he's representative of your, your average 25-year-old bloke. Um, you know, I think, I think he's, he's partial to a pasty or two or a, a sausage roll. So uh, it's very difficult to actually, you know, manhandle a patient from that position and, and get him on the board. Um, especially when your access is limited. So if, if Dara's family are, are listening, sorry. <laughs> but he is a big guy. See some movement there? Yeah, they're doing well. They're doing really well. So we just another, heard another 20 whistle. seconds, they would, have, uh, they would have had the patient out. <laughs> 